the way. Thanks, Ryan, uh, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm very conscious that this is the last uh, presentation of the two days, and um, in order to avoid too much information overload, I'm not going to introduce too much additional uh, data, but I'm going to try and draw together some of the things that BJ and Larry have already outlined. So in, in England, the age of criminal responsibility is 10, and that means that a child of 10 is of sufficient maturity to stand trial and is responsible in the same way as an adult for their behaviour. So they, for a serious crime, would be treated in precisely the same way as an adult with some modifications to the legal process. And so for Jay, at the age of 10, he was treated um, as an adult, and this contrasts with typically higher rates of um, cut-off for criminal responsibility in other Western European countries. So as things currently stand in the UK, there's a real lag with um, what's happening in the, the British legal framework and in, here in the States. Developmental immaturity is not recognized at all in English law, uh, either in terms of competence to stand trial or in terms of making a defense for diminished responsibility. So Jay, at the age of 10, couldn't say, well, I was only 10, I'm only a kid. Um, he's treated as an adult in terms of the responsibility he holds. There's no um, recognition of diminished responsibility by virtue of developmental immaturity. I want to just um, highlight very briefly issues around competence to stand trial, um, because this, this is currently being reviewed by the, the Law Commission in the United Kingdom. This is concerned with um, the ability of someone to engage uh, effectively in their trial, and in the United Kingdom this is determined by something called the Pritchard criteria, which I won't have time to go into. Suffice to say that these criteria are well over 150 years old and related to um, a deaf mute man um, which obviously bears very little relation to the modern context where we have 10 and 11 year old children being um, evaluated along the same set of criteria. But what happens in the current context is that typically a child is assessed by a psychiatrist who looks at issues of mental illness and a psychologist who will look at issues of cognitive ability. There is really a broad recognition within the legal profession and within practitioners that um, this is obviously an outdated approach and does need reform. There are a number of weaknesses of this approach. Um, obviously, it uh, takes no account of developmental immaturity, uh, so the same criteria apply to children and adults. It also sets an extremely high bar, such that it's only in very severe cases of psychiatric disturbance or learning impairment that someone is typically regarded as unfit to plead. And there, uh, finally, is a real disproportionate emphasis on IQ and cognitive ability rather than other domains we know to be important for competence, such as suggestibility or decisional competence. So the first proposition that I want to move to, which really um, draws uh, from both what BJ and Larry have outlined already, is that across cognitive and neurobiological domains, a child of 10 is developmentally immature. It doesn't seem too, too much of a, a shocking proposition to make. We have already seen from Larry evidence of cognitive development across the adolescent period, and there have been a whole host of domains where Larry and others have um, documented improvements in performance in areas that we know are relevant for issues of responsibility as well as confidence. And I won't have time to go into any of these. And BJ also has outlined evidence for functional development, again across a range of domains that are relevant to understanding adolescent behaviour. And these tasks have uh, related both to cold cognitive tasks involving planning and decision making, as well as those involving social and emotional processing. So just to remind you of a few, we've already seen um, evidence for heightened reward sensitivity in adolescents. Uh, we also know that there is heightened uh, emotional response, heightened reactivity of the amygdala, particularly to negative um, social faces such as fear, and this is another study um, from BJ's group, where there is heightened um, amygdala activation relative to younger children as well as relative to adults. Uh, the work of Sarah Blake, more at UCL, has highlighted uh, the differential activation of the medial prefrontal cortex in tasks involving um, theory of mind. So where adolescents have to think about their own intentions or the intentions or mental states of others uh, tends to uh, be associated with significantly heightened activation in the medial prefrontal cortex, one of the areas that is implicated in um, a distributed theory of mind network. 
What this actually means in terms of function, we don't know. Um, we don't know whether they're working harder or whether they're using different kinds of cognitive strategies, but it's certainly a typical pattern that has now been replicated across uh, a whole series of other studies. <coughs> so just to really graphically summarize using one of um, um, Larry's own figures um, that I've borrowed, the early adolescent um, period is, uh, can be conceptualized as um, an early um, set of um, an early maturation of this potentially incentivizing circuit involved in affect processing and reward, which um, is only um, paired with a late development of these frontal regulatory control circuits, which potentially opens up this developmental window where there is heightened um, association with risk taking. But the other general um, conclusion is that there is a period of development in important circuits underpinning behavior that occur from the age of 10 into adulthood. So this quote kind of um, just jumped out at me on the plane on the way over, which was a quote from Professor Williams in 1978 when he was referring to the age of responsibility in the United Kingdom. What is the magic age of 10, he says? Why not 12, 14, or 16? Of course, any age must be arbitrary. And he's absolutely right. Any age must be arbitrary. The question is, as Larry has said, at what point do you make that cut off? Well, I would hope that as we begin to acquire more detailed and objective information about all of the different levels around adolescent development, we are in a better position to think more carefully about where that cutoff should be. Now, in the second half of my talk, um, I would like to focus on uh, this question of maltreatment, and that's my own particular area of research interest. As, the, as well as the clinical work um, that I'm engaged in. So this proposition is less substantiated by empirical evidence, but it's one I think that we're going to uh, learn more of um, in the next five and 10 years. And that's that early adversity alters the balance and trajectory of adolescent brain development, amplifying and prolonging the propensity for risk taking during this period. In other words, adolescent um, vulnerability interacts with a prior experience or perhaps concurrent experience of maltreatment. So here I'm showing alongside um, this very simplified model um, the influence of the environment which is extremely important particularly when we're thinking about child development. We've already heard of the influence of peer uh, pressure as a key environmental factor in adolescence but another important factor is the influence of um, the home environment. And for many of the children who are engaged in um, antisocial behaviour, uh, there are very high prevalence rates of early maltreatment and abuse. These are some figures published last year in the United Kingdom from the Prison Reform Trust of 200 children that were in custody at a given time in England. And what you can see is that there are very high levels of uh, family um, separation and maltreatment and neglect, very much mirroring the kind of uh, family background that we saw for Jay. So these kids really are not having a typical background and the kind of adolescent research that is, uh, is done that we've um, seen already tend to be done with normative adolescent samples. But the reality is most of the adolescents caught up in this kind of uh, criminal um, behaviour tend to have a very um, adverse set of early experiences. So what we've seen is that at the behavioural level, um, adolescents are showing heightened levels of risk-taking behaviour and part of the endeavour is to try and understand um, the neurobiological and cognitive underpinnings of that. And for adults who have had um, child experiences of abuse, we know that there are significantly elevated levels of illicit drug use as well as alcoholism um, into adulthood when there are at least four risk factors uh, present. This is just one particular study. But such um, increased risk of, um, or heightened risk of delinquent behaviour or risk taking also occurs during the adolescent period as we've already seen. So this is a study comparing the presence um, or absence of physical maltreatment. Um, I'm simplifying um, what the researchers actually did here. And you can see that there's a heightened level of delinquent behaviour as well as of alcohol use in those children who'd experienced uh, physical maltreatment. But the interesting interaction is that in those kids who show high sensitivity to peer influence, that impact of maltreatment in terms of risk-taking behaviour is further amplified. 
So this really just encapsulates this notion that there's an interaction between abuse as well as um, adolescent um, sensitivity to peer influence. Okay, so what do we know about maltreatment? Um, we know quite a bit about the impact in terms of structural differences on the brain. Unfortunately, as you can see, this is a long way from thinking about behavior, so the connections between risky behavior and structural differences are difficult to establish. But we do know that several regions, such as the orbitofrontal cortex and potentially the amygdala, are um, showing atypical structural um, patterns in kids who've been maltreated. We also know something now about the functional differences, but I think there have only been around five functional imaging studies looking at kids who've experienced maltreatment, but there have been more in adults with prior histories of abuse. And there are um, quite a few studies looking at cognitive impairments in planning and memory in these kids. So one of the studies that we're doing in our group is uh, looking at the impact of childhood maltreatment in a group of 10 to 14-year-old children who are in the community and refer to social services because of concerns at home in terms of domestic violence, physical abuse, the, the typical kind of risk factors that we've just outlined. And there have actually been very few studies of this kind, partly because of the difficulties in recruiting this uh, population. So the ethical hoops to jump through in order to recruit 25-odd kids is significant, but it partly explains why we have very little data around um, these kids. So we predicted, um, very unsurprisingly, heightened amygdala activity and an implicit emotion processing task. Here, we, uh, the kids simply had to decide, is this face male or female? And what we find is heightened um, amygdala activation for angry versus calm faces. And in, interestingly, I want to talk to Irene about this, we're also finding heightened anterior insula for anger, but not for um, processing sad faces. So there may be some underlying expectation of anticipatory pain associated with anger um, for these kids. In adult studies of children who have, um, in adult studies of adults who've had prior histories of childhood abuse, there is um, preliminary evidence of um, basal ganglia um, differences in terms of reward processing and sensitivity to reward cues, which fits with um, this general idea that it's not just in terms of emotional response, but it's also in uh, reward processing where there's an impact of early maltreatment. So just to go back to this figure, in other words, what we're saying is that um, the interaction between these two regions, potentially a largely subcortical region implicated in emotion processing and reward, and a higher cognitive control region, that the, um, the interaction between these regions develops in an atypical way, precisely how we yet have to establish, but there's an atypical pattern of development that may underpin heightened levels of risk-taking for these kids. We also know, for example, that there's heightened risk of psychiatric disturbance and all kinds of poor outcome that are associated with maltreatment. So I can't believe I'm actually ahead of time here, so I may finish a few minutes early. But just to conclude, I would hope that what we're seeing here is an emerging explanatory model based on neurobiological and cognitive research that means that we are now in a position to characterize with increasing objectivity the developmental maturity of children and adolescents. So I hope that we're from 1978 when Professor Williams made his comment, we're actually in a much better position to think objectively about what we can understand about child development, competence, and responsibility. This research has the potential to at least inform how we treat children within the criminal justice system. This is obviously a, a non-controversial um, claim to make here in the States, but in the UK there is still a long way to go, and part of the challenge is to think about how to engage with the legal system for them to consider how this kind of research may be relevant in considering legal policy. I would suggest that there's at least preliminary evidence that younger children who have experienced early adversity are doubly disadvantaged by both virtue of their developmental immaturity, but also because of heightened neurocognitive risk associated with the experience of early maltreatment. And I would like to end with a wider question which is whether in the cases of very young children, such as Jay, so kids who are 10 or 11 years old, society's collective failure to protect them from violence and abuse, and that was documented in the serious case review subsequently, whether that has compromised um, a child's 
already limited developmental capacity, such that our approach to criminalise them rather than uh, care for them, as well as limit their future behaviour in an antisocial context, is neither ethnically, ethically or rationally justified. So I think it raises questions um, about how we balance uh, a criminal justice approach with an approach based on welfare and rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I suggest we take uh, a question, Remi remembering to use the microphone. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk, and uh, I found all three talks uh, um, 